Hello and welcome to Greatest Somerville for December 13th, 2016. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest tonight is Mark Levy, the founder, publisher, editor, and major contributor to the online news source Cambridge Day. Mark is originally from California, but has called Cambridge his home for many years. His publication, Cambridge Day, focuses on the news in and around Cambridge, including some in Somerville, covering politics, business, development, breaking news, and the events that affect Canterburyian life. It is my pleasure to welcome for his first visit to Greater Somerville, Mark Levy, the publisher, editor, and founder of Cambridge Day. Welcome to Somerville Community Access Television. It's a pleasure to be here. First time appearance though, isn't it? Yes. Yeah? You've been on Cambridge Television. I've I seen have. you on Cambridge Television a couple of times. Yeah. A little bit. It's good to uh, hit the... <laughs> Start expanding, yes. expanding Cambridge Day world. Um, we've also met several times in the past covering political events. Um, I've hosted a couple of things over at Cambridge Television. Yes. And you and I have uh, crossed paths, as they say, in the political world. But uh, it's been a hell of a political political roller coaster this year. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, on every level, I, I think that... Not uh, just Cambridge and Somerville, all over. Yes. Yeah. But, but I mean, I don't want... <laughs> I don't want the election of like some random guy to the you know office of the president of the United States to overshadow you know our local uh, state rep race or anything, for instance. That's right. And we saw each other again at a forum when we were talking about the presidential election. There was yes. a forum over at the uh, Cambridge Public Library. So, you know, it's going to be interesting, Mark. You know, covering hyper local news when so much of the news this past year has been about the national yeah. election. But Cambridge Day. I'm just, you know, for the folks at home, just tell us a little bit about, you're a writer by profession. Um, you got into um, Cambridge Day very early on, n over 15 years ago? Yeah, uh, let's put it at 2005, which is a ridiculous thing. It, it actually started as a, uh, a print publication, as a daily. I started a daily newspaper in 2005 and uh, and as you can expect, that lasted for about a month. So there you go. Became very clear the advertisers were needed. Um, well, there's a little tragedy there. I mean, the advertisers started showing up at the very end. I mean, I remember very clearly the day we were shutting down, we were taking calls from people saying, I would like to advertise in Cambridge Day. How do I get your newspaper delivered to my establishment? And it's like, yeah, today's our last day in business. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. Poignant. But, the, you know, we're going to talk about it a little bit more because I've had other folks in the media on the show. And we've talked about the future of print versus the hyperlocal or the local online media news sources only. So in Cambridge, you've still got Cambridge Chronicle. Yeah. And you've got Cambridge Day. And we have a news source. We're not going to forget our friends at Cambridge Community Television. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other free newspaper over in Cambridge that kind of is in competition with other print? Well, we have things that uh, show up. We have um, Scout, can't be forgotten, as, yep. a, uh, as a magazine. Right. Um, monthly, bi-monthly. Bi-monthly, yep. And uh, we do have other sites that cover Cambridge News. Um, and we do have those interesting sites where they, they have carved off a section and they'll cover stuff like anywhere. So there's eater.com coverage in Somerville and eater.com coverage in Cambridge and uh, Curbed.com, like the same family, uh, Chowhound, and like, so you, you sort of have all of these places to look for little bits of the news, of what's going on. Right. So it's actually a very innovating process to keep up with everything that's going on because there's a million places to look. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. You know, here in, this, in Somerville, we've got three print weeklies, and then we do have Scout Somerville. But, um, you know, as far as the news sources for... Um, print, any kind of print. They all have online sites as well. Right. But, you know, it's interesting that people still go for that tactile. They're still looking for the print. And I think it's age. I, th that I should talk, but there's an a a very much a differentiation between who the viewers are of, say, Somerville Neighborhood News that I co-anchor here at Scott TV and folks who will go to the local convenience store to pick up that free newspaper. Unfortunately, what's happened is the Somerville Journal, which is the oldest of the three papers, 
is a four, is a, they charge you for the newspaper and it's down to like six pages. And it's sad. And which is interesting because the Cambridge version of that, owned by the same company, Gatehouse, is a free publication. Right. So, right. so to your credit, they perceive that there's still value in extracting money for every publication, every copy of that paper from Somerville. Y you know, I've known many of the editors, and you've known some of the editors of the Somerville Journal, and it still amazes me that Gatehouse is keeping it going because that, the circulation on that thing has dropped precipitously over the years. And who will still spend $2 for news that is maybe a week old? It's a problem, and I've never understood the way they do their online news either. There seemed to be a while where there were, we want to see the paper come out in print, and right. then we'll post this stuff online, right. and I don't know who that served at all. But, um, but the whole issue of print is sort of interesting. Like, on an industry level, it's, you still find advertisers are more comfortable being in a print publication, mm -hmm. which is, I think, one reason why that newspaper goes on is uh, there's legals advertising from the city, and right. then there's all these advertisers, these legacy businesses who, like, well, we want to be in the paper. We always have been. Um, and, and that's seen nationally also. But I was sort of interested to see that when you think about the death of print, it's sort of belied by the fact that you have, uh, look at Dig Boston, mm -hmm. okay? So that's everywhere, people pick that up for whatever reason, there's a million reasons to pick it up. Uh, and that's serving, I don't know, age 18 to age 50, let's right. say. Right. Then you have... Um, but the what is the, I, I haven't read Dig in a long time, but what does their advertising look like? Do they have a lot of advertisers or? Very rich in terms of arts and entertainment and uh, sort of restaurants. Yep. Um, uh, as you know, the Boston Phoenix went out of business, and someone would argue that the big hit that it took is that the internet took away all of its porn ads. Classifieds. Yeah, there was no more need to. We'll call them classifieds. Sure, we'll call yeah. them classifieds. Um, yeah, and it did. did. It did. Tragically. Right. But that could be said now. I mean, where are we in terms of online news sources taking away the readership from the print? And how do you get the advertisers onto Cambridge Day saying, I oh, have more eyes? That's yeah, a puzzle. I know. That's a, this is something you have personal experience with. So. I'm, that's a puzzle I'm very excited to like, get to solving. I think I have some answers. I'm very excited to try them out. But what I wanted to say about the print thing is that if you think about the market for Dig Boston, and then you think about the Boston hassle, which puts out, it puts out the Boston Compass every month. Mm -hmm. And so that goes to an even younger audience. Um, I don't know, like uh, age 16 to age 35, maybe. Right. Right. And at a recent school committee meeting in uh, Cambridge, I was fascinated when the editors of the Register Forum, which is the newspaper that serves the Cambridge Rinch and Latin school mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about an audience of like age 14 to 18 primarily. Right. They came before the school committee asking for more money not to have a more robust website, but to make more copies of the register forum. In print. In print. Right. Because they, because the, the kids find it a more communal experience. It's a more exciting communal experience to grab a copy of the paper instead of look at it on a site on their phone, maybe. Mm. So there's still a basis for readership in print. And I, I would argue there's going to be for at least the next five years, five to 10 years. Yep. Um, well, the argument, too, I mean, uh, Holly Banks, I'm sure you know Holly, she's the publisher for the M Scout magazines, both Somerville and Cambridge. She came on my show when she first started that magazine, and it was 2008. So you remember, 2008, 2009, and I just, I was flabbergasted how anyone would have right. the juice to start <laughs> a print high-gloss magazine in the middle of that recession. And you know what? She did it. Yeah. She did it. And it's all based, it's based on, you know, the, the, the joy that she has and the passion that she has for that magazine, but it's also based 
almost solely on the advertising. That's where she gets everything, is all based on the advertising. So it goes back to, you know, classifieds were always a big part of the print. You don't have such a thing. On Cambridge Day, it is a news site. I've never monetized the site. There are people who come to me and say, how much does it cost to advertise? And I will make that happen for them to the best I can. But it has never been a thing that I have been wanting to focus on. Um, I just don't believe that. I'd rather focus on the news. Uh, I just don't have time to to do everything. But is it something? Is it something you would have to do at some point to to stay viable? To stay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah in the long term, there should be right. there should be a switch to making the site pay off. And well, I get to quit the day job and just do Cambridge Day. Right. I should I should mention to people at home, you have a day job. I mean, Cambridge Day is your baby and it's your passion, and you have folks that contribute. They yes. contribute a lot to contributors, not in the monetary sense, but writers. Yeah, I've been uh, incredibly lucky. Um, there have been some amazing people who come uh, to work for Cambridge Day, um, and they write about uh, development and legal issues, and they write about Cambridge Housing Authority and the Health Alliance. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got mm -hmm. that right. Mm -hmm. Cambridge Health, yeah. <laughs> Housing Authority, Health Alliance. Um, they're both CHA. Right. Um, the school committee. Uh, has been done by uh, a woman named Jean Cummings for like several years now, and it's just been like amazing uh, that these people have come forward and that they keep contributing. And I, I guess for the same reason that I do, it's our form of civic engagement. It's it's how we make sense of the community we live in and, and how we give back and talk to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got um, you know Cambridge is a, a, a we call it the twin city, sister city, the twin the twin city. So you've got also a very valuable resource in Cambridge Community Television over there. Yeah. Have, is there any thought in your mind that maybe you partner with them somehow on it's Cambridge Day? A lot of thoughts in my mind about that. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see but how many of those thoughts <laughs> come to fruition. But in this in this period where we're all on this island with limited resources, you know, we're all right. a little wary of each other. I think. Um, there need to be ways developed where we get to share without fear that we're losing market share. Right. We need to find a way that we uh, to share and grow rather than share and cannibalize each other's readers and listeners and you know potential donations. Mm. So hasn't happened yet. Interesting, because we're we're uh, down here at Scat TV. We're going to be looking at some ways of um, revenue, <laughs> revenue inducements, uh, sharing, but. You know, we look at we look at the shows that um, we produce here and that Cambridge produces, and all of the access channels. It's interesting to me that over the last year or so, print, the print providers have become more and more interested in coming in here and producing yeah. some type of a news show. So we do have a partnership now with Scout Somerville. Um, they are producing their content. It, we're, they are producing a show, and we're airing it on our channels. So it's interesting to see whether or not somebody like a Cambridge Chronicle or a Somerville Journal can understand that it, in order for them to survive, their news has to go much farther than once a week, and has to be more than just that newspaper that they, people pick up. They read, it goes on the coffee table, or it goes in the bathroom, and then it leaves. It goes away, as opposed to something that's on YouTube or on a channel, and you can go back to see it again, or it will repeat itself on a television station. So that, that's the reason I'm asking you the question, is Cambridge Day um, thinking about going into another form of media? still being a reporting and a news entity. Uh, I think about those things a lot. And in a way, this isn't new. When I was, when I was editing at the, the Fitchburg and Lemonster paper, the Sentinel and Enterprise, we would call into uh, a radio station every morning and mm -hmm. talk about what was coming along in the paper. So, you know, this form of like cross-media, you know, pollination is not totally new. I think that there's a drive now sort of, you know, Facebook comes along and uh, makes a change in how its newsfeed works and it's emphasizing video and suddenly everyone's like, well, we need 
Facebook to be directing readers our way, we need to be making more videos. And suddenly everyone's doing it. But I have to tell you, from some of those day jobs that I've had, there's not as much viewing of all of those videos as everyone would like to think. Why is it, though? I mean, I, you know, I was told by putting my shows up on a tw you know, 28 minutes of a talk show, people's attention span isn't mm -hmm. that long, especially on handheld devices. You know, if you're on the subway or you're going someplace, you're not going to sit there for 28 minutes watching a show. Yeah. It's more comfort chair television type of thing. Yes. So how, how do we get the news to people timely and make it more important to them in the hyper-local world? So at the moment, this involves a lot of, uh, a lot of working with or it, it involves a lot of use of the social media. Um, I focus on Twitter and Facebook. Occasionally, I will do Instagram only because it also, there's an automatic feed to Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, there's almost only so much time that I have to, to use social right. media. Um, and I'd rather be building a site that is interesting enough on its own that people know to bookmark it and come back to it. Uh, so I'd love to see the level of articles discovered through search go down. Mm -hmm. So personally, I don't have the bandwidth to add more media and to, to do new and more kinds of media. Right. I'm also not wholly convinced that we're going to need to because people are always redefining the future based on the latest thing that comes along. And then those things sometimes die. Right. They don't always right. work out. That's right. And, you know, I, over Thanksgiving, I was sitting with a, a niece of mine, and she was like, uh, well, I'm not on Facebook, and no one I know is on Facebook. And I was like, OK, well, that's interesting. So do you use something? And it's like, yes, we're all on Instagram. Like, well, what difference does it make then? Right, right. It's still social media. <laughs> yes. We don't care what you call it, but it's still right. posting out right. there for the world to see. That's very exciting for you to be on Instagram, but right. you realize that four years down the line, you know, it's very likely that someone else is going to be saying, we're not in, on Instagram. We do right. something Ask else. Right. She remembers a thing called MySpace. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason, you know, the reason, Mark, I love talking about this stuff is because you know, the demise of the three newspaper town, really, I think, my opinion, has hurt people's engagement locally. Yeah. And for, you know, sites like, uh, sites like Cambridge Day, um, or two of our local print newspapers, or Somerville Neighborhood News, Cambridge's neighbor, neighbor media site, you know, it's important for people to stay engaged locally. Because when, I, I, it was so funny to me when homeowners in the city of Somerville got their, their water bill, this was back in sometime in September, August to September, they were shocked and there was outrage that there was a $60 charge levied on the water bill. Unbeknownst to the vast majority of people, had they been tuned into hyperlocal, right. they would have found out that it was coming. I'm just going to guess there were people who were outraged and saying this was not publicized. Correct. There was no public process. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And the city never sent me a notice right. six weeks in advance to tell me it was coming. Yeah. I was one of the ones that was a little angry at it, though. But speaking of hyperlocal, you did cover, I noticed on your site that you were covering that massive Cambridge fire, um, the recent fire that was over there. Those folks, I, I watched uh, Greater Boston, and Browdy had a couple of, uh, Denise Simmons, I went to high school with Denise Simmons. Denise Simmons and um, uh, I forget who the other person was. But they were talking about the massive turnout in terms of contributions that came to those fire victims. Half a million dollars within four days, three days? It's been amazing. Totally amazing. Cambridge, is, uh, Cambridge just said, you know what, whatever they need. At this point, that is about $650,000, so it has exceeded the $500,000 goal, and that is just, that's just the Mayor's Fire Relief Fund, uh, so it's just one site. Right. Uh, the city manager estimates is going to be another 100000 to 200000 from corporate donations. Uh, there is another 100000 that came in from people walking into City Hall and handing over checks. Right. Uh, 
Um, Do you remember course, what the total count was? Over 100 people displaced. Yes. Um, it was 10 buildings or 11 buildings, over 100 people displaced. Eight buildings were most directly uh, affected. Um, there's about, I think, five that have been totally demolished mm. uh, on two streets, Plymouth and York, um, if I remember that correctly. There's a, uh, the, I guess one of the real questions is, uh, and God forbid we have to answer it anytime, uh, what is the capacity if this were followed up by something? Mm. So Cambridge, blessed community, very wealthy. It has, you know, it has these amazing like uh, credit ratings, and it has this like every year it beats a beats its own record in terms of yep. free cash. Yeah. Um, and That's we why are they blink by the way for the twenty five million dollars for the Green Line. They have that hanging around, half of which it, came, yeah. but half of which came from um, the developers of North Point. Really? So it wasn't as. Wasn't yeah, I as wish we had somebody who would have put the squeeze on our developers for that, but uh, no such luck here. Uh, it, it, it makes it easier to do things like uh, we have these school projects, mm -hmm. and we were going to do three or four. And we figured, like, the first one we'll do. We'll handle that. And then the state will reimburse us money for, like, the next two at least. Right. And then, no, it's not happening. Uh, Cambridge decided that we were going to build them net zero for greenhouse gas emissions. And that is not something the state is able to calculate an interest in. Right. So there's no reimbursement coming for any of these projects. So the first one was 96 million, 95.5 million. And then the next one was... Uh, hundred plus million. I'm sorry, I'm blanking they, on the figure. And they just wrote the checks. The next one coming along is is uh, all right. So the second one is 160 million, and then the one after that is unknown. Probably a little less because there's so much going into uh, the second one, including our new administrative offices for the district. Mm -hmm. And so the city can handle these things alone. But then Trump gets elected and says we're going to defund sanctuary cities. Right. And even if you can't do that, um, there could still be impacts that we're going to have to make up. That cost is estimated at $14 million a year. Uh, it, you know, the joke is eventually this starts adding up to real money. Right. So right. the ability of Cambridge to respond to all of these things and to pursue all of these projects, um, I get the feeling that it might actually be tested sometime in the next few years. Yeah, I, I looked at, uh, I looked at, you know, Somerville is also a sanctuary city and our mayor has basically said, go ahead and do it. And I think it amounts to even a, either 11% or 13% of our funding. So, you know, Cambridge and Somerville are not that dissimilar. But the reason I was asking you the question about the fire victims is that um, a friend of mine who was n not directly involved but um, made an appeal, you know, to if you're going back on the show, if there are Somerville people who know, excuse me, <clears throat> people who were involved in that fire, you can still make a contribution and donation. Call the city hall over in Cambridge, American Red Cross, any of the reputable places. So. That's why I wanted to ask you about it. Still and the fund is still live online, too. It's a GoFundMe.com site, the right. Mayor's Fire Relief Fund. Right. Well, national coverage, I mean, we touched a little bit about it in terms of how that affects your local coverage. Yeah. I mean, politics is politics, no matter where you go. My joke earlier was that, you know, Trump might have overshadowed our, you know, new state rep a little bit. Um, but, I mean, my brief is local news like yours. I mean, you, you have to stay focused. Our uh, national coverage, as it were, was it was basically how did our town vote? Correct. And uh, a little bit of, you know, how do you prevent yourself from, you know, unleashing a little bit of, like, you know, outrage to the heavens? Well, it's called the editorial. <laughs> That's right. You are the editor. You can do it. That's right. Uh, Cambridge Day posted that if there are any electors who have committed to the Republican candidate and on December 19 opt to switch to the Democratic candidate, uh, Cambridge Day will cover any of their fines resulting from 
um, you know, being a so-called faithless elector. M meaning Mark will cover your fine. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that it's is correct. Not, it's not like you're dipping into the pool somewhere, you know? No, no. That, 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 a brave man you are, Gunga Din. <laughs> How much could it possibly be? Yeah. Um, uh, no, but if I, if I went broke paying the fines of electors who managed to get Hillary Clinton elected president, um, I would be, I would go broke happily. So. Well, I got to tell you, you know, I mean, with all due respect to my friends over at the Cambridge Chronicle, I do click on and look at Cambridge Day because I think it's one of the Thank better you. sites for uh, up-to-date, accurate reporting. The question comes in is how are you going to make that work for you going forward? You have a day job. You're going to have to uh, start do either doing sponsorships or advertising. No, it's a great question. Um, but I don't want to do traditional advertising. I, I think that there's only so much you can do with a whole bunch of very colorful ads all fighting for people's attention off on the side of the page. And I want to find better, more creative, less intrusive ways to communicate, to have businesses communicate with readers. Mm. And I have a bunch of ideas that uh, are just basically waiting for a solid programmer to, you know, sit down with me and, and hash this out and, and try these. Um, that doesn't come cheap, so I am looking at uh, some funding sources and I'm hoping, I'm hoping really hard that that's, that's what I do in the new year. Well, you're right in the middle of the brain trust over there in Cambridge. Um, it's There's true. There's got to be somebody who's willing to do it for you on the cheap, <laughs> Mark. I mean, come on. I'd love to think so, but we are at an age where people who are good at programming and user interface and that sort of stuff, they do not feel like it's in their best interest to continue to throw out their skills. For and nothing. Exactly. Right. Like, oh, more equity in the company than might never happen. It's well, I, for one, I like your site very, very much. Thank you. So I wish you all the success in the world. Hopefully this won't be your last visit to Greater Somerville. Back. Come on back and we'll, uh, we'll do another show. Fantastic. All right. Thank terrific. You. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. My guest has been Mark Levy, the editor, publisher, and founder of Cambridge Day. And on behalf of myself, we won't be back next week. So I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and most of all, a very, very happy new year. As always, stay safe, stay informed. See you next year.